Bibles, and I hope you do, open them up to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Probably the last time you heard the passage that we're going to look at today uh, was at a wedding. And that's a good application for this passage of Scripture, but it has a broader application for us. Uh, I think in the church, particularly, we need to remember the principles that are here for us. I, uh, I grew up an Air Force brat, mostly in the northern part of the country. We spent six years in Alaska, upper Michigan, Montana, Kansas, Nebraska. We, we spent two times here in Missouri, and I graduated from high school here in Missouri. Times in the Philippines, uh, let's see, where else, California. Uh, we were all over the place. But everywhere we went, there was a new Southern Baptist church plant that had been started by the Home Mission Board. And when we went to the Philippines, we were a part of a uh, uh, what was then the Foreign Mission Board planted church, which was half Filipino and half American servicemen. And so I oftentimes, later in life, as I begin to understand God calling me to ministry, I knew that I likely would not serve in traditional Southern Baptist land because God had grown me up in a world that was different from that. And I had come to understand how little presence there is in most of the North and in the West here in the United States when it comes to evangelical messages, the preaching of the gospel, calling people to repentance, and meeting Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. In most of the places that I lived, there, weren't, there was not another church in the community that was accurately sharing the gospel itself. And I don't mean just accurately. There weren't other evangelicals at all in those areas for the most part. So I am standing before you this morning basically as a product of the cooperative program of the Southern Baptist Convention. Your regular giving through the past put missionaries in the field where I heard the gospel, where my mom heard the gospel and came to Jesus, and our family was transformed by Jesus Christ. Everywhere we went, it was uncanny. Whether it was in Fairbanks, Alaska, out in the middle of nowhere where Allison Air Force Base was, in a new Southern Baptist church plant. Whether it was just south of Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, a new little Southern Baptist church plant. Everywhere we went on the journey, God was pursuing us and chasing us with the gospel. In part because of the giving of faithful churches like yours that gave for the cause of missions across North America. So when God called me into ministry, he brought us back here to Missouri where my first church was in a little town called Leeton. Anybody ever heard of Leeton? Yeah, one person in the, here in Missouri. And I, uh, maybe two, okay. So most of you have no idea where Leeton was. There was a sense in which we loved Leeton because we were close to our parents uh, on both sides of the family, but we knew clearly that likely God was going to lead us further north, and he did that. He took us to Iowa, and then he took us to, to Minnesota. Today I serve as the executive director of the Minnesota-Wisconsin Baptist Convention, and so I oversee about 200 churches across our two states in the church planting efforts and the church health efforts that take place across our convention. I also pastor Emanuel Baptist Church in Rochester, Minnesota. So this morning, as, as I come and have the privilege of being with you, one of the men in our church will bring the message this morning in Rochester, sharing the gospel there in that place. We are in this together. Those of us that have gathered together under this Southern Baptist umbrella that we, that we are a part of need to understand from time to time how much bigger the family is than just us. We are rightly focused on our mission field, as you would be right here. But God's great commission is for the entire world to hear the gospel. And as you and I participate together in reaching the people here in this community and across the state of Missouri and across North America and the rest of the world, we take seriously what Jesus said in Acts 1.8, that we would reach into our own Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth with the gospel. So thank you for doing that. When I look over at the sign on the wall and see you participating in the Reuben South uh, State Missions Offering, that reminds me of when I was pastoring here in Missouri and we participated in that. The, the benefit of being in this together and being useful to God's kingdom purpose because we are in His hands operating and, and working together for the sake of the gospel. Here back, uh, uh, back in 2011, many of you will remember the tsunami that that destroyed the coast of Japan. You remember that event? Uh, a terrible earthquake 
uh, 18 miles underneath the surface of the ocean, sparked this amazing tsunami uh, where the waves were moving. Uh, they estimate about 450 miles an hour, 110 feet toward the coast of Japan. The decimation was unbelievable, as you know. About 16,000 people lost their lives, but they say this was the most costly natural disaster in the history of the earth because of the decimation that was caused. We have seen that here in North America. We're seeing it even right now in Louisiana with another hurricane that is going in. But in the midst of that devastation, you might remember that, that Japan really pretty well out of a sense of national pride basically did not receive any help initially. They stood still and tried to gather their own wagons and, and, and meet this unbelievable disaster. Ultimately, they began to open up and receive the assistance of other nations in that process. We were gathered as Minnesota and Wisconsin Baptists at a meeting we call Empower when all of this took place, about two days before the meeting. And so in the meeting, while we were worshiping the Lord, it was like the Lord said, you know, this would be a great time to take up an offering. I had already heard that it was difficult to, to take missions money into Japan and how that was going to be a difficult process. But we, by working together, brothers and sisters, through the International Mission Board, were able to take up an offering on a Friday night and be able to transfer those funds on Monday morning into the state convention and then all the way to the IMB and then all the way into Japan to help your brothers and sisters in Southern Baptist churches throughout Japan be able to minister to their neighbors in the name of Jesus Christ. That's the kind of stuff we can do because we're connected together. God put us together on purpose. And He uses us when we work together. This morning, you are in Louisiana ministering to the people who have faced this last disaster. Missouri Baptists have many teams, DR teams, that are ministering in Louisiana right now. Minnesota Wisconsin Baptists have many teams ministering in Louisiana right now. Every, uh, it's almost every day right now, there's a conference call among our national leaders saying, so what are the needs in Louisiana? I can take that one. I'll take this one. And together we go into those areas and meet the needs of the people that are there because we do it together. So you are already there this morning because of your ongoing giving through the cooperative program. You are there doing ministry in this place. Now, you may not be able to see this. Very, oh, it's pretty strong up on, on the screen for us. This is the presence of your brother and sister churches across North America. When you look at it, our Southern Baptists, as we, would, as we call ourselves, are strongest in the South. But we have many churches in every part of the country because together we have on purpose intentionally planted churches in those areas across the entire nation. Now, some of those areas in the West, as you can see, they don't look like they have very many churches at all. Most of those areas don't have very many people at all. My mom is from Nevada. It is the only county in the state of Nevada, for this small mining town, that has a strong presence of evangelicals. Why? Because you've got a church there that has reached that community with the gospel. When you move up into the upper part of the upper Midwest, there is population in Minnesota and Wisconsin, particularly Minnesota and Wisconsin, where I serve, over 11 million people there in that place, but we had few churches. In fact, this was the last area that we actually moved into as Southern Baptists, intentionally trying to take the gospel into these areas. And so we have fewer churches in Minnesota and Wisconsin, but we have been growing. Ten years ago, we had 150 churches. Now we have 200 churches in Minnesota and Wisconsin. How do we do that? We do that because of your help through the cooperative program, through your gifts to Annie Armstrong and Lottie Moon and the missions emphasis of Missouri Baptist and of this church doing missions throughout the world. God has put churches there to bear witness to the gospel. When you look at Wisconsin, there's one SBC church for every 51,000 people. That shows you the need in Wisconsin. In Minnesota, there's one SBC church for every 63,000 people. Now, that's horrible, folks. But let me tell you the good news. 
five years ago, it was one per 88,000. And so together, we're making progress as we are planning churches in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Now look at this number. In Missouri, there's one SBC church for every 3,000. Now let me just give those numbers to you again to show you how different it is to live in Missouri than it is where I'm at in the northern part of the country. Missouri, in many ways, has many churches proclaiming the gospel. Not just Southern Baptist churches, but you have many other evangelicals here proclaiming the gospel. And every one of you is essential because you reach different people within a community. But in our area, as you can see, we desperately need new churches for the sake of the gospel. We are in our third year of a partnership with Missouri Baptists. And so Minnesota and Wisconsin Baptists have been receiving mission teams from Missouri. And the connections are being made to extend the missions work that's done in Minnesota and Wisconsin. And so I say thank you for that. Thank you for being a participant to that. We've had people from your association, even in our own church the last couple of years, doing work in Rochester, Minnesota. God uses us together for the cause of Christ to accomplish what Jesus told us to do. Now, mind you, we talk about the Great Commission, but do you remember that this is, this is almost the last words of Jesus to his disciples? It is the end of the Gospel of Matthew when Jesus tells us the Great Commission. Does that make it important? Yeah, go like this. Yes! Yes! This is what we're supposed to be doing. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. That's why we call it the Great Commission. Because this is what Jesus wants us to do. And this is what you are doing as we work together for the sake of the gospel. The job seems absolutely impossible. 7.7 billion people in the world today in the United States, some 329 million people that need to know Jesus Christ. In Minnesota and Wisconsin, we have 11.4 million people. And as I've already argued, most of them have not clearly heard the gospel. Most of them have heard renditions of the Bible, but most of them have not clearly heard the gospel let alone been challenged to receive Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. The estimate in Minnesota and Wisconsin is, is that we have less than 6% evangelicals in our two states. The actual numbers bear that it may be less than 5%. Here in, in Missouri, over 18% of Missourians claim to be Missouri Baptists alone let alone all the other Baptists you've got, all the Assemblies of God you've got, all of the other churches that are proclaiming the gospel. Desperately, in the northern parts of our nation, we need the gospel desperately proclaimed to the people in our states. Thank you for your help as we do that together. Now let's open Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their efforts. For if either fails or falls, his companion can lift him up. But pity the one who falls without another to lift him up. Also, if two lie down together, they can keep warm. But how can they keep, one person, keep, uh, person alone keep warm? And if someone overpowers one person, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. It amazes me the amazing wisdom in this passage of Scripture. When we look at it, it, it reveals things that modern science is just now completely understanding, and yet it's right here in God's Word given to us so that we can see it and understand it. I'm going to give you the points of what we're going to look at very briefly as we pass through this Scripture and see what it means for God's people to look together. When we work together, first of all, there will be synergy. Something more happens when we work together than we work alone. Secondly, we find the support we need during difficult times. For instance, Louisiana Baptists need help right now. And so within our family, we support them during this time. There's a symbiosis that comes with this. And by that, I mean it's mutually beneficial to all of us because of working together. 
when you and I have the opportunity to give somebody else something in their need, they are not the primary beneficiary. What did Jesus say? Who is the primary beneficiary when we give something to somebody else that they need? We are. It is more blessed to give than to receive, Jesus said. And so there's a symbiosis that comes with that. We both benefit from meeting each other's needs. And there's an incredible strength that comes when we work together. When we do this, the kingdom of God will grow. People will come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior when we work together. We have primarily done this as Southern Baptists through the cooperative program. For 95 years, the majority of our churches have decided that they're going to give a percentage that they decide. You decide. Nobody decides this for you. You're not Methodist where you have to pay a certain amount. You're Baptist where you give what you want to give. And so our churches have set aside usually a percentage of their offering to go through what we call the cooperative program to do Acts 1-8 missions. Jerusalem, right here, where the majority of the money is spent on missions and ministries here in your community. How it broadens out to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, to the whole world. Every time you give, you touch the world. I remember recognizing that for the first time when I was sitting in this little bitty church outside of Ileson Air Force Base, Alaska, and we got, a, we got a quarter for our allowance when we got an allowance, which was relatively rare, and I would give a nickel in the offering plate, and there was incredible joy in me at that point to think about the fact that I was helping to pay for the lights at our church, I was helping to pay the pastor, but I was also making it possible for missionaries around the world to go to places that I could never go to share the gospel. Every time we give, you're touching the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Missions together through the cooperative program has made an incredible difference. When you look at it today, we have 3,674 international missionaries as of a week ago that are serving on the field. And this number is growing. More are planning to go even now. They're preparing to send them soon. There are over 5,000 partially supported missionaries and church planters in North America. Why? Because God's people work together through the cooperative program to share the gospel in places that you and I are never likely to go on our own. It's what happens when we work together. There are 16,000 students in our Southern Baptist Seminary. Now that may not sound like a whole big deal to you, but let me say this. Of all of the seminaries in the country, only about eight of them are either growing or staying at the same. Six of them are yours. God is doing something in our midst, preparing young men and women for pastoring and for missions throughout the world. It's amazing to me when I look at the numbers on the other seminaries. They're just dropping off. But God is continuing to work in our churches together to call out people to be able to take the gospel to the world. Where I am at and where I serve, 95% of of our SBC churches in Minnesota, Wisconsin, were started through cooperative program giving. 95% of our churches. That would not be true here in Missouri. In the early days of Missouri Baptist, people began to gather in communities and and they didn't have the assistance of the larger family. In across North America, where we have planted churches intentionally, 95% of ours were planted through giving through the cooperative program. <coughs> Let's look at what that looks like specifically here in the Bible. The word is synergy. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their efforts. I use the word synergy because it sounds like this. My wife is a math teacher. My daughter teaches math in St. Louis. And so they hate this when I say this, but under synergy, one plus one does not equal two. It equals three because there's a better return for your efforts when you work together. When we work together, something special happens, even in the natural sense, let alone with God's blessing added on top of it. There's a synergy that takes place when we work together. In 1885... The bit, one of the big events, they didn't have the Super Bowl and they didn't have the World Series, and so they did mule pool polls. You got any of those around here still? 
We we still have them in Rochester, Minnesota, and they're draft horses. They're not they're not mules, but they they do the same thing. You'll remember that they'll put a pallet out and they'll put a certain amount of weight, and a team will pull it. And that, that year in 1885, the winning team pulled. And I, I forgot I took that out. The winning team pulled 9,000 pounds. And so they thought, hmm, that's interesting. I wonder what would happen if we took the first place team and the second place team and hooked them up. What would they pull? Well, you would think that they would pull something a little less than 9,000, so they'd be able to pull 18,000 pounds. But doesn't that make sense? But that's not what happened. Instead, they were able to pull 30,000 pounds by working together. It was a little bit of an astounding thing, and people begin to think, so what's going on here that happens when you team up a team, you get more out of them than you could if they were separately doing this? So they, they begin to test this, and they discover that there's about a 66% increase in working together that comes by these mules operating together rather than separately. So I got to thinking about that one day with, with a wife that's a math teacher and a daughter that's a math teacher. And so I thought, so every individual mule should have been able to pull 4,500, half of the 900. But if you work the factor backwards, no, they don't pull 4,500. They pull 2,710 when they work separately. This is when it dawned on me that I had spent much of my ministry doing stuff for the church, working my heart out, day in and day out and getting 2,710 pounds worth of work done when if I had to work with other people, I could have immediately seen greater an increase. And that's when it dawned on me that maybe that's the reason why the King James Version of the Bible has another word for mule. A few of you got it. <laughs> Working together, we see this incredible synergy that takes place. Why would we work alone when God's Word is revealed to us that when we work together, we can do more together than we could ever do alone? Secondly, out of this very same passage of Scripture, we see this context of support that comes when we work together. For if either falls, his companion can lift him up. But pity the one who falls without another to lift him up. The concept here is, is that if you fall down and you've got a friend, they can help you. Which of us never needs help along the journey? All of us need help from time to time. My wife is going to have foot surgery here in a, in a couple of weeks. She is going to need my help because this independent woman, who usually needs very little help, is going to be sitting there with her feet up and going to be dependent on her husband. In reality, all of us go through those times where we need support from each other. We need a little help from our friends, as the old expression used to say. We need each other. And when we're covenanted together in the church, we have each other. When we're covenanted together in a family or a body of churches, we have each other. Louisiana Baptists need other people right now. And they will get and receive the support of us collectively being able to go in and help them during this incredible time of need. The way the cooperative program works is, this, is similar in that regard. The, the church that you see on the screen is the church that we belonged to when we were in the Philippines. And I remember having this question come up. I would have been a freshman, or I think I was probably a freshman the year that I asked this question. We would have missionaries all the time in our church because they used our church kind of as a halfway house. So they'd come in the first six months that they were in the Philippines. They'd get acclimated. They'd learn about the Philippines, and then they'd go wherever they were going to go. And so we constantly knew missionaries. We knew their kids. We had friendships with them. They were constantly there. We never took up an offering for any of those people because we were giving through the cooperative program. But on Sunday nights, we were taking up offerings for people we didn't know all the time. Other people's missionaries that were in the Philippines who didn't have the benefit of the cooperative program, and one of their church would have a church fight. God forbid. But all of a sudden, their budget goes boom, to nothing. And they had promised to support those missionaries out in the field, and they could no longer support them. They couldn't even get back to the United States to raise money. 
And so we were taking up offerings to send these people back so that they could they could raise the money to come back into the mission field. Finally, one night, I just I asked the pastor. I said, said so what's the deal here? I don't understand this. We, we raise money for everybody else, but we never take up an offering for our own missionaries. How come? And that's when he explained to me how we do it differently with Southern Baptists. We support missionaries together because in all likelihood, we never have to bring them home in a crisis. Because one church is doing great when another church is having trouble. And so it balances out in the process. The crisis rarely comes because of the regular giving that comes through the offering plate through the cooperative program. So one church drops out, another's doing fine. Life goes on on the mission field. As a result of what we invest through the cooperative program in the mission field, we're able to do extra things, like be able to take mission trips and help the missionaries that we are already supporting with the gospel. And so we're able to do things like Buckets of Hope. Do any of you remember Buckets of Hope when we helped Haiti? I saw one hand. Uh, we, all across the nation, what we had was, was we had a specific recipe of what needed to go in the Bucket of Hope after Haiti had had the earthquake. And we sent semis across the entire country. Churches packed the rice and the beans and everything that we needed. And the semis went across the country, picked all this up, took it into Florida Baptist put it on a ship, and took it into Haiti, and they didn't dump it at a, at a government station like you and I would do with our government do dollars. They took it out to the 800 churches that were in Haiti that we had been a part of starting through the International Mission Board 30 years ago. And so then they gave the food out to their friends and neighbors. And that's why some say that over 30,000 people came to Jesus during that crisis through the churches, your brother and sister churches that are there because you helped put them there 30 years ago. We did it as a family, operating together for the sake of the kingdom. And God makes an incredible difference when we do that. Because of that per permanent presence, we're able to do so much more in the other things that God lays on our heart to do. Third, symbiosis. This is the, the concept that, that comes to us out of mutually beneficial. It, it, the, the text says, also if two lie down together, they can keep warm. But how can one person alone keep warm? Now that may not mean as much here in Missouri as it does to somebody in the Holy Land or to somebody that lives in Minnesota or somebody that lived in Alaska. One of the first things that they did when we got to Fairbanks, Alaska, is we had to watch this videotape on the effects of frostbite. And they showed us the devastating damage that comes to a person physically in a very short time over frostbite. And one of the things I'll never forget was the guy that gave the presentation. He said, and if somebody has, has a foot or a hand that is, that is freezing, and if at all possible, you open your coat up, and open your shirt and let them put their hand or their foot into your tummy to try to warm it up to be able to keep them from losing it and having to have it cut off in the event of frostbite. I remember the impression of that as a fifth grade boy, seeing a picture of that thinking, man, I don't think you'd do that twice for anybody. But in the Holy Land, it's a similar kind of thing. The altitudes are surprising to most North Americans. It snows. In the Holy Land, in some of the devastating places in the Holy Land, at night the temperatures at our high elevations drop down very cold. And so it was the normal practice and custom of the day that if you were journeying with somebody in, in the cold of winter and the cold nights, you owed your body heat to somebody else. Now that makes us really uncomfortable here in the 21st century Americans but you couldn't sleep off over in the corner in your nicely insulated sleeping bag. You slept very close to each other to share your body. The concept is right here for us. Now, the commentators that look at the Hebrew language say that the physical aspect is there, but that's not all that's here. There's also an emotional symbiosis that comes to that. There's a mutually beneficial sense of emotionally support that comes when we're working together. That because we are together, we are stronger at the emotional level 
Now, brothers and sisters, in the country in which we live right now, with all that is happening to us, we are going to need that emotional support in the future. Already now, it seems at times like we think that, that we're the only ones that are out there. We will need the support that comes together when we gather with the body of Christ and we are reminded we have other brothers and sisters that know Jesus and trust God's Word. And we will need the emotional support, the symbiosis that comes in that as we gather together. This mutual beneficial support cuts across all of our needs and gives us the strength to be able to stand physically and emotionally in the world in which we live. Hurrying along, number four, and the final one, is the strength that comes through all this. In verse 12, which is often the, the passage that we use at a, at a wedding, a cord of three strands, and then we have, we have added that that third strand is God. That's probably pushing the text beyond what it says, but it is something of an application. Let's take this text at the simplicity of what's here. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. It's just simple here. What the Bible is telling us is what we learned as little boys. You remember whether it was school number two pencils or it was sticks out in the park. You break one easily. You break two a little bit more effort. You put three of them together, it gets much harder to be able to break it. It's a principle of life that's revealed to us here in Scripture. When we lived in Alaska... My brother and I, who was, who was 18 months younger than me, we would go to school early, even at 25 below or 40 below zero. They didn't cancel school until it was 50 below zero because we wanted to play king of the mountain. And i got to tell you, in Alaska, the, the mountains are much bigger than the one you see right here. And so we would, we would fight each other before school to be king of the mountain. And my brother and I figured out that if the two of us could get to the top and stand back to back, there was nobody in the school that could remove us. Because of the strength that came by working together. Basic principles of life that carry on over even into the mission field. Jesus reminded us that we will receive what? Power! When the Holy Spirit comes upon us to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Our strength is not only in physical closeness, although that is a dimension that this passage mentions, it is also the Spirit of God in us, limitless power, to be able to accomplish the great commission of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are strong when we stand together. It's interesting that the, the book of Acts ends in a very weird way. You don't see it in an English translation, but you see that this, these are the last verses in the book of Acts. Remember what the book of Acts is about? The book of Acts is where the church is, it becomes... Jesus ascends to the Father. He empowers the church through His Spirit. And mission starts in the book of Acts. And we see all of this astonishing thing, these things happen. We get to the end of the book of Acts, and this is the end. And it really doesn't, doesn't come clear for us in an English translation. Paul stayed two whole years in his own rented house and then welcomed all those who visited him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. That sounds nice and clean. But the language of the New Testament says, unhinderedly is the last word. You've got an adverb at the end of a sentence, and that shouldn't be, according to English. It should have an ending. But Paul, in the infinite wisdom of the Holy Spirit, wrote it differently in the Greek language. He ended with an adverb to tell us the job's not over. You've heard the beginning of the story. Now do the rest. Take the gospel to the ends of the earth, is what Paul is saying, just like what has already happened. Continue along the journey. And the kingdom of God continues to grow. Well, I pastored in Sioux City, Iowa. Sometime in the first year, I picked up the newspaper, and I read this story about Herman Ostry from Bruno, Nebraska. Now, the deal was, is Herman had a, a barn that was sitting on his property, and the, the little creek, you know something about creeks around here and streams and rivers, the little creek had meandered over, and it was eating out the foundation of his barn, and it was starting to tip. And it was very clear that there was very little he could do. He was going to lose his barn. And so they started to think about, all right, what do we need to do? We're going to tear it down and build a new building. But that was going to cost a lot of money. So Herman had a major problem. 
that part is true. What I imagine happened at that point, being being a Missouri boy myself, is I, I can imagine that they gathered at, at the cafe early in the morning after the guys had done their chores, and they're sitting around drinking coffee, and Herman starts talking about his problem. And the guys around the table are hooping off, and they're being funny about things. And I imagine, this is my imagination now, I imagine one of them says, well, why don't you just pick it up and move it? And I can imagine the other guy said, that's ridiculous. Isn't that funny? You can't move a barn. But guess what did happen? Now I'm back to the real story. I, that part I don't know for sure. But they decided that maybe they could move the barn. And so Herman went and laid concrete over on the corner of his lot where it was safe, put down a new pad foundation for this barn. He went back over to the barn and had a bunch of friends show up, 328 people who wanted to see and be a part of this experience. They took hydraulic jacks out. You can see this is an actual picture. They lifted up the barn high enough. They wrapped that barn with 328 people, and then they shuffled. set it down on the foundation to the report. 328 people did what seemed to be absolutely and totally impossible. Why? Or how? Because they did it together. Together. This week, as you hear from the other missionaries, you will hear incredible stories of what God has done because we do it together. We take the gospel to the world where people desperately need to know Jesus Christ and lives are transformed and changed. We do it the way Jesus told us to do it. We go and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with the world around us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the great privilege that you have given to us to know your Son, Jesus, as our Lord and Savior. If there's somebody here in this room today that does not understand what Jesus has done for them, if they've never received Jesus as their personal Savior, if they've never repented of their sins, we pray, Father, this morning that they will come to Jesus. And if they don't even know what that means, that they would come and talk to the pastor or leaders here in this place so that they might have a relationship with Jesus Christ and their eternity be transformed and changed as a result. Father, I thank you for your people here in this place who have been faithful to work together with other people across our nation and the world for the sake of the gospel. Lord, may your blessing rest upon their hearts. May you give them a vision of what you can do and continue to do through them for the sake of the Lord Jesus and for the sake of the world. We thank you for all of this. In Jesus' name, amen.